Hello, this is Martin Stepan from Pro Proprietarian Institute. Uh, I'm going to be talking about natural law. Uh, Bowman already went into its history for a bit. I'm going to do a quick recap. Uh, the, we know back to the Greeks. Uh, they were talking about it. Uh, Aristotle distinguished between law and nature. Uh, law it differs across various places, according to him, whereas what is by nature is the same everywhere. The stake saw that there is a rational order to the universe and that a rational being should live in accordance with it. Cicero uh, believed that law comes from nature, that it is just and true. Uh, that it is eternal and same everywhere and statutes that are wicked and unjust cannot possibly be laws. And we go to Christianity. Uh, in the New Testament, in the Romans, we to mention that Gentiles, which do not have the laws, uh, do by nature the things contained in the law. And Aquinas remarked that human laws to be judged by their conformity, no, human laws are to be judged by their conformity to natural law. And unjust law is not a law, just like Cicero said, but a perversion of it. So all of these people converged on the same basic idea. Uh, the thing is they talked about natural law and they had no idea how nature actually works. That took Darwin to figure out in the 19th century. And now that we understand the processes of nature, well, we can observe how natural law emerges from life itself. So life is basically a process of replication. There are many definitions floating around, but that's all it takes really, I'd say. So obviously organisms replicate, ideas replicate, sometimes because they're actually good, sometimes just because they're so good. Uh, products on the market replicate. Uh, if it sells well, more of them are going to be made. Uh, businesses that sell these products, they're going to replicate. Someone's going to make a similar business. Uh, super organisms can replicate, which is, for example, a nation. Like Britain replicated itself to America. And your court cases uh, or peer reviews in science, they have to replicate. And since this universe doesn't allow for perfect copying, uh, you always get some variation in the copies or diversity, if you will. Uh, then you got negative selection. Uh, the obvious example is natural selection. The organisms that have the wrong strategy, they're not going to replicate for one reason or another. They might just die, or they might not find a mate, anything. Then in regards to uh, the court cases or peer review of just ideas, there's falsification. We figure out that the idea it doesn't work, so we get rid of it. The idea is that. Uh, the products that don't sell, they'll fail on the market. They die, they're selected out. 
Uh, now these three things, replication, variation, negative selection, they together form evolution. Uh, they repeat infinitely and like Darwin said, you got endless forms of most beautiful, both on nature, on the market, everywhere. Uh, uh, obviously, replicators that are better at doing the replicating, at not being selected out, there will be more of them. They will survive through time. They will resist entropy. And now they act like they have a purpose to do this, because the ones that act with that purpose they're just going to be better. Yeah. Just to get competition of them because there is scarcity of resources. They have to compete with each other to get them. Uh, and they are, can compete by doing the negative selection. You, are, you kill your competitors. Now you don't have to worry about them. Or, you just better at mating. Uh, and basically, this creates a hierarchy. So now, uh, uh, give me a second. Uh, hierarchy is basically a value scale. Uh, some things are going to be more important to you, some things less. It will base your behavior based on that. Perform uh, arises, arises positive selection. Uh, you get obvious example sexual selection or when you're buying a product, you're making sure that it survives. And this positive selection, it is still subject to negative selection because uh, ones that select badly, like who they want to mate with, or what products they want to buy, so on. Uh, if they make the wrong choices, the, they are themselves going to be selected out in the end. We get uh, Red Queen effect. It is a basically competition between different replicators or arms race, let's say. We get between predator and the prey. Or which is like the most famous example of the rabbit is faster than a fox because the fox is running for its dinner, but the rabbit is running for its life. Uh, the point of this is uh, that the slow rabbits are selected out by the foxes and slow foxes are selected out because they don't get dinner. This, the slow ones of both species die out and they both force each other to become faster and faster. Another example of this is evolution of parasites and hosts. So parasites are trying to find away some loopholes in the host uh, to obtain resources from it. Whereas the host is trying to find new means of detection and eliminating the parasites. If we can expand it to lying, get more complex forms of lying, and we get better at figuring out what lies, and we punish liars. We can even use this concept in like automatization and labor. More complex machines are arising and they're competing with the labor force. 
and this, they each <laughs> try a version of each other. So, the labor has to become more intelligent to be able to compete with the machines. Um, we have the concept of utility, I've already mentioned. Uh, Hume remarked that this is what beauty signifies, which is absolutely correct. Just, if you see a beautiful person, what does that mean about them? It's, it's just a feeling, but obviously in woman it means she's fertile and it means that she has a low mutational load, which means she's basically normal. She <laughs> <laughs> she's some average. Uh, she hasn't accumulated mutations across time due to lack of selection. Under normal conditions, she die. We don't have normal conditions right now. The opposite of utility and beauty is deformity. You just see something is, is wrong with the person or, or with the thing that's supposed to be beautiful. Now, since the, what we need in the world is cars, this creates the law of supply and demand. And since these things are scarce, we don't need to just get them, we need to defend them when we have them. There, the concept of property arises. And when we can feel somewhat safe that we gonna keep the property we have, we start investing in it and improving it. We, among other things, we can handle land like this. And since we want to make sure uh, that others don't steal our land and it is in fact beneficial for the others to know where our law ends so they don't accidentally steal it or tread upon it, borders arise. We can observe it in woods even. There was this photo from Yosemite Park where wolves were tracked uh, and across time you've got these lines of different packs. They hardly ever went into each other's territory. It works in many different species. Groups arise because the a group of individuals can outcompete single individuals. So, a species that start doing this, individuals are just done. So they, all of them have to compete groups of their own. And those grow, groups, under normal conditions, are going to be ethnocentric. There was a simulation. Uh, the ethnocentric cooperation is the most successful strategy. We have forms of forms of groups, two different strategies. Uh, it's it's more of a spectrum. But we have a herd. A herd has little to no structure. Usually, no proper leadership, no hierarchy. Uh, the only point of heard is that there are safety in numbers. So you basically hide in the group, so you're safe from predators. Uh, the herd members suffer from fear of being left behind. The other form of a group is a pack. Uh, pack in pack, members cooperate. They can divide their labor. Uh, they start forming hierarchies of competence. There arises a reciprocity intuition for the first time. And the ones that would 
destroy the group from the inside or betray it somehow, they need to be punished. So that this is disincentivized. Otherwise, the, the individuals, the group members could profit by parasitizing other group or betraying it. And this is what we call altruistic punishment. This is just obvious by other pack members. This, this is the first jury of peers. Uh, like Rick told me on the last meetup, we even see that in crowds. Like they formed a circle around uh, the crowd that did something bad, like murdered a uh, crowd. They decided to do it, really punish it, we usually kill it. <laughs> So this is where we first get the concept of rule of law. We, the point of which is maintaining the adaptive conditions so that, that make sure the group is able to compete with the other groups and last throughout time. It creates disincentives uh, and if someone still despite these incentives, keeps behaving badly, you just get rid of him. Support him in the territory or we kill him. So it, that kind of behavior is less likely to be in the gene pool. Now you're all familiar with reciprocity, right? So the point is, for, in order for every group member to be voted, to be, to remain a group member, the exchanges have to be limited to voluntary, which means nobody's taking from him something that he doesn't want to give up, that, is defect, that he defends as invested in. They have to be productive, so that this is uh, to the benefit of the group. Uh, they have to be warranted, so that uh, if you made the wrong exchange, if, if it's not what you hoped for, or rather not what you were promised, then you can ask for restitution. They have to be fully informed. You have to know what you're getting into in every exchange. And they have to have no negative externalities so that the group doesn't pay the cost of exchanges of two people within it, two group, subgroups within it. This prevents violence and retaliation cycle inside of the group, which make the group weaker, less likely able to compete with the other groups. Uh, now let's talk about information. Information is basically a strategy. It, it tells you what you should be doing in the world. The more you know, the better you, you understand how to get what you need, basically how to achieve reproductive success if you're doing it right. Uh, the information starts in the genes, it's carried, and you get vertical transfer to the next generation. And in primitive organisms, you also get horizontal transfer. Uh, so we have bacteria that can give each other information about some immunity they learned and just teach each other and they're a better group. They're all immune. Obviously when we get more complex organisms, we can no longer do that. So we invent other ways of sharing information. This is called signaling, or memes, language. 
no, no, no. the information is true basically when it's adaptive it's telling you what is real and you know what to do whereas if it's false you're gonna make wrong choices so someone who's giving me false information is imposing costs on you. But it's, he's going to make you behave in a more maladaptive way. And reciprocity necessitates truth because speech is a form of exchange. And then when you get false speech, you're basically getting your bad product, not the one you asked for. And we get bubbles. Well, bubble is basically a lie. And it's always subject to inevitable correction because you know the reality is what it is. If you believe something wrong, it's not gonna work. It's eventually gonna going to be corrected. Or it's going to be selected out. Now, before you had language, it worked very simple. You had all the information within yourself. You didn't communicate it with others. If you were wrong, you just not reproduce, or you would be less successful than others, and you'd eventually disappear from the GPU. On the other hand, after we get language, uh, we get the concept of social epistasis. It means uh, basically you're signaling to other group members and the, the way they behave, it's, it's no longer affected just by their genes. It's affected basically also by people around them, by their genes. So gene of one person ch can change an expression of genes of another person. Now, like, like I said, uh, an individual can profit at the cost of the group. Um, in regards to this, he can do so with lying. He can. Uh, this is the kind of parasitism. It basically destroys the group conditions that make it work if it's going on for too long. Uh, because correction will inevitably come and uh, correction always does some kind of damage. The best case scenario, when a guy is telling you some nonsense, you correct him, the only damage is his price. The worst case scenario, that's the biblical flood, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were doing things that didn't work, so they were selected out. In other words, extinction. I can speak about currency. Currency, despite what libertarians say about gold standard, the only point of currency is information about value. That's all it needs to do. Uh, yes, it's great. When you don't sell out lies and you start getting too many, well, the meanings of words are constantly altered. And it's, there's no point in believing anything. Well, basically, the signal, it turns to noise. It, it's meaningless, which is what Rick said about money. That's what happened about the currency. It became meaningless because its value kept changing. <coughs> Let's talk about mating. Uh, the reason why so many species with uh, and that are slightest with slightest that are even slightly complex uh, they have two sexes 
in order to have a gene pool. Uh, until uh, that happens, and as asexual reproduction, your gene pool is basically your genetic code, only what you have within yourself. Your offspring is going to be exactly like you, plus some mutations. Uh, now, the parasites can exploit it. Predators and exploit it because they know you are going to behave in the same way. So, uh, when you have a gene pool, now there's more variation. What doesn't work gets selected out. There's more options for what works. Then we have differences in strategies like R and K. Uh, R is basically for living in conditions that are unstable. You can never properly adapt to them. You have to live fast and die young, reproduce as soon as possible. It's not worth it to invest in the offspring. Uh, whereas K is in dangerous conditions, but predictable conditions. So you prepare for those conditions. Uh, you help each other with the offspring, invest in them together. And when you get to the extreme end of the spectrum, which really is humans, but it obviously even within humans, we can still see the spectrum. Uh, at the extreme okay, end, it requires the investment of both sexes, which is rarity in the animal world, everywhere else. Really. Uh, and in order for men to invest for investment from men into female and their offspring to be worth it, there arises demand for female chastity. Something that even Hume remarks on. And marriage arises, which is a union of the sexes for the production and investment into offspring. There's no such thing as gay marriage because that's not what marriage is. Uh, now, when we have a society that has excess of women, which are somewhat more unselected, uh, when men go out and fight, many of them die. It makes sense for one man to have many women. Whereas uh, the numbers are roughly equal, uh, we get monogamy. Uh, this also creates a demand for male chastity because he has to limit to himself to one woman. This is uh, against every male instinct. Now we have the two strategies that roughly align with RK. We have consumption, which obviously we all have to consume in order to survive, to reproduce. But if we don't have limits to consumption, there's a risk that we are going to consume the conditions that have made our group functional. It's the bubble, as I've mentioned again. It's overconsumption. On the other hand, we have conservation. This means that we do define limits for what we can consume and what we cannot. We maintain our common property and we only consume its fruits and we even add to it so that we have even better conditions for the future. Conservatives have uh, discussed sensitivity instincts. Which Basically, what they find disgusting is something that endangers the group. Uh, something that would destroy these conditions, that would consume them. It's 
So, but in natural law, it is the optimal solution to a certain evolutionary problem. Uh, I've mentioned variety of them. There's ethnocentrism, there's marriage, there's currency, and there's obviously altruistic punishment using reciprocity as a limit. Uh, all of these things make the group more adapted and uh, you see them arising in independent groups in different human populations, even in different species, which shows how necessary they really are. And if you ignore the natural law, uh, then you're going to be selected out eventually. And that's why we need the rule of law to make sure that everyone sticks to the natural law or that we select him out before he can do any damage to the rest of the group. Sadly, we don't have the natural law in most of the Western world. Uh, it's somewhat keep at it, but we have legislation which doesn't have to align with natural law at all. It can be, like Cicero said, unjust and false, and it makes the conditions in group for everyone worse and brings us closer to extinction and to entropy. And that's pretty much it. <laughs>